introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Bridget Dory. I'm the communications manager for the board. Hi, I'm Leslie Hervey, clerk to the board. Hi, I'm Hamilton County Commissioner Alicia Reese. Good afternoon. I'm County Commissioner Denise Treehouse. Jeff Aluto, County Administrator. Michael Friedman. Thank you so much. Stephanie Sumrall Dumas, President of the Hamilton County Board of County Commissioners. Uh, we will start our meeting as we always do uh, with a moment of silence. And then at that time, if you could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, I would like to say a few words. Uh, before we begin, uh, we have had so many moments of silence, which is awesome um, for us to recognize those who have died, those who have had tragedies. I think about Ukraine and Russia, just going all the way back since I've been here, uh, the moment of silence, which started way before me. Uh, but of course, unless you're living in a cave, uh, you heard just recently about Uvalde, Texas and um, the 19 babies uh, that uh, were killed like cattle. They were just, um, they were just in their rooms and the, the coward came in, whoever it was, they don't know if it was that person or not, and closed the doors on these babies and just like targets, shot them all. So we also had two teachers that were impacted. And there were others that were impacted. There were law enforcement people who um, did not pass away and we're hoping that no other teachers and no other law enforcement people will be uh, impacted by this tragedy. Um, but I say, you know, prayer is fine, it's great. Uh, we have to continue to pray. pray is all, prayer is always in order but I say action, um, and I'm not just the only one saying it. I heard it in the halls of Congress and everything, but action as it relates to Hamilton County. Uh, what are we doing? What have we done? What do we need to do differently to make sure that the schools, the places here are safe? And I know we're doing a lot. We have a great director of uh, emergency management, um, but what do we need to do in addition to make sure uh, that we're all safe. It could be our children, it, you know, it could be our wife. Um, and so we, some people think because it was way in Texas and uh, no, it could happen any day, anywhere. So I wanted to, to speak to that and I know maybe the, my other colleagues also want to do the same, but I'm calling for action uh, from the county, the city, all the villages, the townships to take a look at what you're doing or not doing uh, to make this place safe. I know we talked about having jobs and you know how that might curb the violence and, and mental illness. Of course, we know uh, there is mental illness. I mean, we we've, we've added money through the county to help with that um, illness, but there are also ways that we can safeguard and protect and be um, look ahead to what might happen. So I'm going to leave it at that. I would like for us to do uh, 21 seconds of silence um, for those uh, victims and I will start with this and hopefully it won't. So if you could bow your heads and I'm gonna one, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. 19, 20, 21. Thank you so much. If you could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 
I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the previous session. Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Reed? Yes. Commissioner Dreenhouse? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, we have before us uh, public comments. Kevin Farmer? <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, and like, I, and like the president said, blessed those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. So understand that. And uh, I want to get down to business when it comes down to my proposal I have submitted on Madam President's behalf, Stephanie Dumas, in regards to the cryptocurrency blockchain task force that I'm advocating for. Um, I feel what, I'm, what I really want is a resolution to be made to be able to have this task force. I submitted a proposal in regards to how to why the count why the county crypto task force should be established you got to understand in the united states over the past several years there has been an increase in the use of digital currency and cryptocurrency decentralized digital currency based on blockchain technology such as bitcoin ethereum and others as both an asset and a method of payment blockchain technology and cryptocurrency have reached a point that merits evaluation as the potential opportunities that may provide for efficiency and cost saving to the county. Uh, a Hamilton County Cryptocurrency Blockchain Task Force will be able to review, analyze efforts and potential opportunities undertaken by other local, state, and national governments about cryptocurrencies. Um, I believe the functions will be one, we'll have a study uh, if and how Hamilton County can benefit from a transition to a blockchain based system for record keeping, data security, uh, financial transactions, payments for county taxes, fees, and services, um, and services delivered. Two, identifies ways to improve government interactions with businesses and the public. Uh, and three, the security of these systems prior to the adoption of any of these new payment methods. So I believe that this is vital. I have sent uh, uh, hard copies and emails also to Jeff administrative assistant Ms. Christine Hollis Holly and Christine Holly so and I do have the support of the Department of the Hamilton County Treasurer thank you so much and thank you for coming forward I did from my chair um, su suggest and advocate for you to send in your proposal and you did I have not reviewed it I don't know if the other commissioners have but I certainly will review it okay thank you Jack Renekamp. Oh, yes, Jack. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. I'm here as a 40-year LGBTQIA public servant um, to thank the board on behalf of the action that they'll, they're planned to take this afternoon in uh, raising rainbow flags at county, various county facilities in celebration of Pride Month. Um, it's important uh, both as a individual and as a public servant that I see that other government entities are recognizing the importance of LGBTQ employees and citizens within Hamilton County. And I also want to invite you, if you um, desire and have time to attend, the city is also hosting a flag raising ceremony on June 1st at 3.30. Um, I'm co-chair of the city's relatively new employee resource group called City Pride. And um, we're, along with others, are one of the sponsors of this event. And so if you're available to attend, we welcome you too. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, actually, that's our first item on the agenda we'll be discussing. Um, I will move forward. Those are all our public comments. There's an, okay. Um, so I'll move down to my comments. I actually. Uh, do not have any additional comments. I would like to mention to my colleagues that I will be sending you a memo as it relates to um, small event funding. Uh, we certainly uh, did agree on funding for the large events, which was um, the Jazz Festival coming, and we are also looking at Blink as a funding uh, effort. One is 650000 and uh, uh, Blink is 750000 if it's approved. And I have suggested, and just suggested, but now I'm going to bring it forward formally, that our small events uh, in the villages and townships and all these communities 
uh, that are having these uh, festivals that we give a portion of our funding to them to help them out also. Um, looking, and I'll put it all in writing, but looking at paying 20% uh, of their costs not to exceed uh, $10,000. I see a lot of festivals getting started, um, and I would like for us to move as quickly as we can before the summer is over to make that happen. But you will be getting uh, more information from me on that. Vice President Reese. Yes, thank you. Um, certainly join in the comments um, made in um, the increase that we are seeing, and certainly most recently in Texas and New York. Um, you know, we have had a lot of a lot of talk. There's been a lot of tragedies like this over the years. Um, going back to Sandy Hook and beyond, and uh, even a member, a former member of Congress, while she was a member of Congress, uh, got shot in the head, and Congress didn't make a move. We are, um, when you look at other countries that are looking at us, this is not happening. It's happening here. Uh, that is, we are the land of the free, and we should, be able to have a safe environment um, every time there's always you know would be excuses and I was talking to our administrator uh, Jeff Aluto yesterday and I was very concerned about my my the baby nieces I call them my they're the youngest of the family just in school I'm calling their mom and I'm freaking out like you sure they need to go to school today or you know it's just you know it's everywhere uh, in the past, it used to be, well, it was a certain neighborhood or it's a certain street or uh, a certain income level, um, certain race. Uh, it, it's, it's everywhere. Um, Bernadette Watson, who many people know um, in the community, has done a lot of work, was former chief of staff uh, in the mayor's office and former community council president in Avondale. And I remember she would say that, you know, I'm not afraid to go anywhere. And the other day she said, as a senior citizen, I'm, I'm afraid, can't go to the grocery store, can't, you don't know what is on someone else's mind. Uh, you know, this really has to stop. And people are asking for action uh, versus lip service. And uh, obviously there are laws that are in place that supersede us. Uh, but one of the things I would ask, and I don't, um, you know, this doesn't stop all the problems, but I think uh, calls for some preparedness, is the uh, emergency, emergency management uh, group. Nick does a fantastic job. I think there needs to be a coalition of folks across jurisdictional lines in Hamilton County um, with superintendents across Hamilton County our emergency management folks. I see this when we talk about uh, we get ready for an attack from somewhere else uh, when the attack could come from right here at home, right here in our own neighborhoods, our own communities. It can happen anywhere. And I just think having, um, through Nick's leadership, uh, a group that could be pulled together with Sheriff McGuffey, uh, with all the law enforcements of various jurisdictions, superintendents of various school districts, um, private sector business owners to put together some type of planning, if you will, the brightest minds in safety to create some kind of safety plan. And if something, Lord forbid, were to happen in this direction, what do you do? Where do you go? How do you deal with it? Um, what, what are some pre-things that can be done? Uh, I think we need to put an all-in effort of a proactive approach. We can't stop everything, uh, but I think that um, I have some faith to put that group. We have it for addiction. We have a coalition that's dealing with addiction. We, have, we had it for COVID. We brought everybody together as it relates to that. We need this, I think, under the leadership of our emergency management uh, team because we are uh, as a people at a state of emergency. How do we protect ourselves here uh, and prepare ourselves here uh, at home? And I know school. each school has their process and somebody else got their process. 
just we need an overall process. And if there's people that need training on processes and all those kind of things, uh, I think this is just one step uh, in the right direction. So uh, I've just asked the administrator if he would reach out to our emergency management and add that to part of our emergency uh, strategy for Hamilton County. Now, as far as changing laws here, we don't do laws. We don't have home rule. I've been at the state house trying to fight for laws. Uh, we were always in the minority, me and Commissioner Driehouse, uh, you know, and certainly we encourage, uh, but even at the state house, they've made it where, you know, locally you can't put these laws in place. Cities can't put these laws in place. But we gotta get, a, we gotta get our handle on the, especially these illegal guns, tracing them back. How they, it, I never see it traced to how did they get their hands on it? <laughs> where is that group coming in that's getting these illegal guns on the streets? So um, because of that, we're limited in that regard, but we're not limited in terms of emergency management getting uh, prepared. The second thing I wanted to talk about, I wanted to keep on the front burner, our babies, babies and milk. And certainly is hitting um, everyone. I want to just correct. I know we've read some articles where it's only low-income women. When a baby comes in this world, um, so I've seen. I haven't had a baby myself, but so I've seen. When they come into the world, uh, they don't know if they're coming in to be poor. They don't know if they're coming in to be in disadvantage. Uh, they all come in screaming, probably said, oh, Lord, I'm <laughs> in the world, <laughs> you know, it was a lot nicer in mommy's stomach, and now I got to get out here to the world. But when they come out, uh, they're hungry. They want something to eat. And uh, I want to make clear that certainly low-income mothers are affected, but non-low-income mothers are affected, because when you have a supply issue and that baby is hungry, and there's no supply, that's an issue. Um, and I know last week we had talked about, uh, I know JFS said we've got a few calls, we're doing a few. I'd like us to, uh, I've asked the administrator, I'd like us to have a proactive plan that could be on our website. Uh, I also see this as an emergency management issue because if we run out of food for babies and they begin to uh, you know, die because of their or malnutrition, then, um, we have other health issues or even a vitality issue. We have been big in fighting against infant mortality. And we had kind of seen that as, you know, don't put the baby in the crib and how to, don't put the baby on top of you and all of that. And we've, we've made some, some, uh, some strides in that. But now we got another layer. A baby needs something to eat. And that can lead to infant mortality. Uh, so I want to put this on the books, uh, Mr. Administrator, as part of our infant mortality, our anti-infant mortality program, that not only we have those other components, we have other people that we fund for that, uh, but I want to add this thing about food supply for infants. Uh, I'd like for us to get a hotline number that people could call, and I'd like for uh, our administration to bring together Jobs and Family Services, along with a Free Store Food Bank, along with Children's Hospital, along with uh, our suppliers, Kroger's, et cetera, and have a somewhat uh, uh, strike force task force so that we can get an understanding of what is the supply in Hamilton County, who has the food. Uh, you know, you'll be able to go on our website and find out, well, you know, this Kroger doesn't have any, but this one does. Uh, maybe uh, Kroger don't have it, maybe Walgreens got it. We need to have a map in Hamilton County where we're helping each other find where is the supply. And then I also want to look at the Free Store Food Bank to see if there's supplies there that could be uh, distributed and helpful. Uh, but I think we need to have that as quickly as possible on our website and part of our anti-infant uh, mortality plan. Um, because that's another component. And this should be available for whether you're on the SNAP program or whether you're not on the SNAP program. Uh, your only criteria is you got a baby that needs something to eat uh, and we're able to identify where that is. So it would be great if Hamilton County was out. I think we probably might be the only county to do it where we're out front showing where the supply is, where, who has some supply, 
uh, working on uh, having, um, you know, some supply, and I'd like to put it on the emergency management list in the future, because now we know if we ever run into this again, we've got a, just like we've got the, uh, the mask and the gloves and those things, we've got, we've got something like this in our, um, we don't call it a pantry, but we have a, a supply area for, you know, days like this that would be emergency. I see this as a major, a major state of emergency. So uh, it'd be great for us as a board to be able to announce the, the you know, on our website, a phone number and something that tracks where the food is, who, who has food, uh, as we are still working to, uh, hopefully as Congress and others are helping to resolve this issue. Um, other thing I wanted to say is that um, the Senior Citizen Fund that we announced, I'm very excited about it, the $1 million, I understand um, uh, some are calling, some don't know about it still. I ran into some senior citizens the other day, uh, and I want to give a shout out. The new Ford restaurant out in Norwood is really, really nice, actually. <laughs> And it was really cool. It's a, a new uh, restaurant, only a few locations in the country. And on their menu, they've got even like uh, uh, items named after the mayor and the you know president of their city council. And then they've got uh, uh, you know I think Joe Burrow's on there again too. Uh, he's on there. But they ha it's really cool. People from the community are on the menu. But it's a really cool thing with the Ford cars, and you go in. It's just a cool atmosphere, uh, so I do want to give a uh, shout out to them. But anyway, I ran into a senior citizen couple and they were asking, is there any help for seniors? And I was able to give them the hotline number. So I just want to reiterate to senior citizens that are out there, uh, the hotline number is 743-9000. You got to put 513 in front of it now, 513-743-9000 for help with utilities and help with uh, any uh, repairs, boilers, heaters, but it's getting hot, so people need help with the air condition. Um, but they can call that number, and it's a, we've got a senior citizen hotline number. So wanted to just reiterate that. And they were happy when I gave them the number to know that we had something like that specifically and directly for senior citizens. So I just wanted to re, uh, repeat that. Um, and then my last piece is, even though I have torn my meniscus in my knee, and I'm just like, oh my gosh. For many, many years, um, many people know my favorite pastime is roller skating, and um, I'm a diehard roller skater. I've skated all over the country in different places, and one of the things that I saw um, for many years, uh, different areas have an outdoor major facilities. Detroit has a great outdoor facility. In fact, this weekend they have a huge skating roller soul skate event and people are coming from all over the world for it i won't be able to join them this year um and then um in new york this year usher uh and some other celebrities mary j blige um, they opened up a uh, helped open up a skating facility at 30 rock and i can't wait to uh you know participate in that and it's all over the social media and um one of the things that when I was on city council, I was really trying to get a roller skating facility built inside of Cincinnati. I ran out of time to name it after Mr. Nelson, who was the first African-American to ever own a roller skating rink down and over the Rhine on the second floor. And I wanted to get it together before he passed. Unfortunately, he passed. I ran out of time. Um, but I'm very happy um, that we will have uh, uh, an outdoor roller, mobile roller skating rink. And uh, it's opening on Friday. And I hate that my, my, my knee is torn, so I don't know, I'm still trying to ask my, my trainer, can I please do a couple moves? But she knows that if I put my skates on, I might want to do the splits, and that would not be good. But uh, this is open to, uh, to the public. It's uh, called the Frisch's Mobile Skating Rink. Uh, that 3CDC is putting uh, out right out in front of Court Street, right down from where we are now. Uh, I saw them putting it down as I was coming in. But the grand opening will be uh, tomorrow, and I'm happy to be a part of that grand opening to see this vision come to 
reality uh, 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. If you want to be the first skates to hit that floor, um, they are only charging two dollars to uh, participate. They're not taking cash, I'm told, so I guess it's only card. And rental skates are five dollars. And uh, I am personally sponsoring the first 50 people to uh, come down for free. I'm always trying to get more people to skate. And I want to say that this has gotten out and skaters from all over Ohio uh, are excited about it and are trying to come down to participate. So uh, New York did it, Detroit did it, but now we're going to show them how Cincinnati and Hamilton County does it. So uh, excited about that. And I know, uh, Madam President, uh, you've been a, a supporter, too, about trying to get roller skating going uh, as well. So I'm um, very, very excited. And I will be there. Nothing can hold me back. And who knows, if my trainer approves, I might be able to put on the eight wheels for like 30 seconds. So hope to see everybody down uh, at the skating rink. And it'll be open uh, all weekend. But the grand opening, I'm happy to be hosting tomorrow, 4 p.m. Um, to 8 p.m right here on Court Street. So thank you. That's it. Thank you. Uh, just a couple comments as you talked about the seriousness of the emergency of the lack of formula. Um, right after the meeting when we left, I called Nick, uh, our EMA director, and he is actively uh, looking at supplies uh, for this area. There is no map available, as you indicated. That would be really good to have. Uh, but it's just really hard to find here but he's working as we speak on that issue um, and as you brought up about babies and babies and babies it was uh, extremely hard for me because um, my great nephew uh, who was de he's deceased two weeks ago 12 pounds 13 ounces came out uh, it was delivered deceased um, so we will be having his memorial uh, tomorrow. So if you could just pray for, um, pray for our family, that would be great. Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you, Madam President. I am sorry for your loss. Thanks. Um, in speaking of loss, um, I too want to comment on the tragic shooting in Texas, the tragic shooting in New York, the tragic shooting in so many other places uh, in this country. Um, the CDC has said that since 2020, firearms is the leading cause of death for children in this country. Firearms is the leading cause of death for children in this country since 2020. It's, a, it's an astounding uh, statistic and very sobering. And I, you know, I appreciate the comments related to preparedness and to mental health, but um, I think from my perspective, and I too sat in the legislature when all the gun laws um, started coming through, and the, the lack of common sense gun laws in this state and in this country is astounding and part of the problem. Uh, and we are heading in the wrong direction in the state of Ohio when we relax background checks, when we relax places where people can carry guns and bars, and it, it's just, we're heading in the wrong direction. And I think um, I agree that action is where we need to be uh, and do what we can. We are so limited as county commissioners as to how we can advocate in this space. However, um, there is an event coming up, and I just want to call it out. This event was scheduled before the most recent shooting, um, but it's being hosted by Moms Demand Action, I think a, a group that we're all familiar with. June 4th, they're having a national, there's a national day of gun awareness. Um, it's going to be more than gun awareness, I'm afraid, um, uh, on this particular occasion. But on June 4th, 10 to noon, on Fountain Square, there will be a rally about gun violence in this country. And so I just want to shout it out and thank Moms Demand Action, Michelle Mueller in particular, for all the work that they have been doing over I don't know how many years to try to raise awareness about how we need to uh, have common sense gun laws in this country. And uh, we need to advocate in the state of Ohio for the same. So um, beyond that, I just want to uh, note a couple other things. Um, as we all know, the TLRC, the Tax Levy Review Committee, has 
been holding um, meetings over the last few days about the three levies that are on the ballot this year, those being seniors, mental health, and indigent care. And the consultants have come in and um, given them information related to the recommendations that they will make to this board related to the levies. And I just want to thank the members at CLRC for the work that they do. Uh, it's a volunteer group. They are very smart. It's very diverse. Um, they have spent a lot of time understanding these really complicated issues that impact the levees and, and the broader community. And I just want to thank them for all that they do and look forward to those recommendations coming forward to the board, I think, in, in about a month or so. Um, also uh, wanted to say I had, uh, attended a meeting earlier today. The Cincinnati Sustainability Committee is meeting. Um, and it, we're going, Chris, Chris Harding from my office also went, to try to get some ideas as to how the county can start to think through sustainability and, and green initiatives, um, electric vehicles being one of them, um, you know, what we've done with some of our facilities, our buildings for another. But there are many, many more things that we can do to engage the community and uh, the county administration and ourselves in this space where um, we can be more green and sustainable as a county and start to create some policies around that. So um, trying to, to learn a little bit from what this, they're a little ahead of us on this, uh, but learning from Mika Owens and, and others that were in the room talking about how the city is trying to become more sustainable. Uh, and then lastly, um, on a lighter note, uh, it's Kevin Ty's birthday today. Uh, my chief of staff is 31. I know you don't mind me saying how old you are, Kevin. He's still younger than my kids, uh, <laughs> which freaks me out just a little bit. Um, but uh, happy birthday, Kevin. Happy 31. He's uh, newly a father of two. Um, so we, you, know, you, you do good work. You've done good work already uh, for the county, and we're celebrating you today, Kevin. So that's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday. <laughs> uh, and for the gun rally, they want you to wear orange. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes, so that's right. Wear orange if you come. Okay. Um, I'm going to move to our administrator. Um, Jeff, as you give your comments, you might want to talk about FIFA. We got some requests for, from them because they are making a final decision June the 16th on who they're going to choose to be part of this World Cup experience. So, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Madam President. I can certainly do that. I, th I was going to plan to uh, provide the board with some uh, uh, more robust information on FIFA next week, but I can certainly give you some information during my comments today as well. Uh, at, a, at a higher level, so thank you. Be happy to do that, and happy birthday, to Kevin. I didn't know I was only five years older than you, so <laughs> this, this, um, that's great. Um, so, uh, first of all, just in terms of some comments, um, uh, um, and I will touch base with um, EMA Director uh, Crosley as well um, to the comments on uh, on schools and organizations and things in, in the wake of, the, of shootings. In the past, we have had. Um, in cooperation with the sheriff's office and what used to be known as the Fusion Center and EMA, there was a program that existed for uh, uh, where schools and other civic organizations could reach out and, and go through a, a, a process by which they, uh, we called it target hardening, where there would be almost a consultant study that would be done as to how um, those, um, uh, whether it's a school or an organization, could. Uh, uh, could enhance their protections against this type of thing. I don't know that that's, con that that's continuing to occur, so I'm happy to reach out, talk to Nick some more, and talk with the Sheriff's Office and see how we can pull that uh, back together as a more comprehensive, proactive uh, program. Uh, infant, on the infant formula issue, um, I'll do some follow-up for the board on this as well. I do know that, um, that uh, JFS does have this as a, uh, you go onto their website and, and it is the first thing that you find are resources um, on uh, the infant formula issue. And I know they are uh, touching base routinely with the, the free store and Children's Hospital and others as well. So I'll follow up with uh, Director Patton uh, on that topic as well and see if there's other things we can be doing in, in line with what uh, the, the board had discussed here today to be uh, actively and proactively uh, tracking uh, tracking that that issue and, and being as much of service as we can be uh, to uh, our local residents on that. Uh, there was a uh, comment on the senior program as well. I uh, did just want to mention that um, I think uh, Vice President Reese mentioned the hotline, the 743-9000. We did receive our first report very recently on the utilization. It's being very well utilized. Um, I think there were 149 utility credits applied. 
uh, 125 of those through Duke, 24 through Waterworks, and 40 home repairs. Uh, so of the total, um, I think uh, around $106,000 um, spent to date uh, on the program. So we're off and running in a, in a, in a significant way uh, on that. Uh, and uh, uh, President Summer Dumas, before I get to the comments on, on, uh, on some, or some remarks on FIFA, I also just want to give a, a brief um, kudos out uh, to uh, Mike Inman and the uh, building inspection staff. Uh, some of the board may have been copied on this, but about a week or so ago, uh, there was an email that came in uh, about a, a building that was in that was vacant and in disrepair and posing a safety hazard. Uh, and the individual was not sure who in the community to go to. And I think within 24 hours, uh, the building inspection department um, had uh, inspectors out there uh, and got orders issued to either have the building immediately repaired or raised. So um, again, we had building uh, safety week just uh, about a month ago, I think, in here. And we had folks in here and just wanted to, again, highlight uh, the great work that they do for the county and, and say congratulations to uh, uh, to everyone from James Noyes as the director to, to Mike Inman, who's uh, on our building inspection staff and, and the individuals that were involved there. Um, so with that, uh, Madam President, you asked about FIFA, and yes, you're correct that and it's, I think it's been in the, in the news and in the newspaper uh, that FIFA plans to make a, uh, an announcement uh, on June 16th, uh, where I believe they are planning to announce uh, host cities uh, at that point for, for FIFA. Um, Cincinnati, Hamilton County has been a um, a candidate to be a host city um, since this process started. I think from the county's perspective, the main issues associated with um, being a, a host city involve ultimately the, the use of Paul Brown Stadium. Um, we know that there are likely some stadium modifications that will be necessary uh, in order for the stadium to fully host uh, uh, the World Cup in, a, in accordance with, with FIFA specs. And I can provide a, a fuller, more detailed breakdown of this, uh, Madam President, uh, next week uh, to the board. But in general, uh, those uh, upgrades would involve um, a, a FIFA specification uh, quality field or pitch. Um, there would have to most likely be a, a grass field. There would also have to be some work done in the corners. As we've discussed before, Paul Brown Stadium was actually constructed um, with the forethought to be able to provide for uh, soccer. Uh, so the corners actually remove uh, out, of the, out of the stadium, the aluminum, those aluminum seats. Uh, there would still need to be a bit more work, concrete work done um, in the corners in order to facilitate the, the field specifications. Um, and then we understand that uh, there are also some upgrades and enhancements that FIFA would be looking for throughout the stadium and things like uh, suites and concession areas and concourses technology. Um, our approach on that ladder, those latter type of improvements largely would be uh, that, and what we have communicated on that would be that uh, if you know, that we would do those things to the degree that they were in the context of the master plan that the board has been briefed on and also in the context of our annual capital improvement program. Um, which we have a, an annual CIP of approximately $5 million annually. So we would work with the team to figure out, uh, with the Bengals to figure out how those uh, FIFA desired improvements would be uh, integrated uh, in, into that. So um, we're continuing to also talk with the team about how uh, it, FIFA, assuming we're selected, about how FIFA uh, World Cup in 2026 would impact um, the, the team itself. We wanna be as landlord to, uh, to the team, we want to make sure that we're on the same page uh, and that we communicate that to FIFA in terms of how uh, the, what what the any concerns that the team would have related to operations. Uh, so, and we've been working uh, as partners with the team on that. Uh, so, again, we're still working through some of the final details. I'm happy to to report back more uh, next week, uh, Madam President, um, including. Uh, on the results of, I know that the CBC is working on a economic impact analysis to better understand as the board has asked for um, the overall return to the community uh, on uh, the World Cup. So I'm happy to include that um, in uh, my report back to the board next week on this, but um, that's, that's a high level overview of where we are. Happy to answer any questions on any of, the, on any of my comments. I, I'm not sh certain that I have a um, a buy leave today. I think we are, are without buy leave, so that would conclude my comments. Okay.
Thank you. And as you mentioned, Jeff, about the final numbers of, for revenue for the county, do you have a general number of what we're anticipating as it relates to Hammond County, what we may be able to recoup from this going on? So specifically, uh, I'll know more when we see the results of the economic impact uh, analysis. Um, I don't have a specific feedback on, on tax revenue and things of that nature, but I, I, I know that uh, from a, uh, a broader economic impact statement, while I don't have a final number, I know that we've uh, heard about um, uh, like the all-star game it being uh, the impact being like 80 to 90 million. And my understanding is that we're talking uh, multiples of that. So, um, so again, more information to come, but uh, I'll get it to the board as soon as I have it. I don't have anything formal on that at this point. Thank you. Um, any questions, Vice President Reese? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, so on Tuesday, I guess there'll be a, a more formalized uh, presentation. One of the things I have been asking for some time was the um, bid package because that really lists whenever you're trying to get a sporting event or a convention, these are the things you must do in order to even qualify. Um, and I know we got a, um, I, I did finally get a memo, but it didn't have the spec uh, specifics. And my understanding, um, uh, Mr. Ludo, from the conversation, you will have to sign off on some specifics that we would agree to do. Um, it won't be a memo, but it will be specific things like, uh, you know, convention hotel, which we saw was about 368 million. Uh, we'd have to sign off on uh, AstroTurf. We have down, but we got to take that up and put grass, and that's a cost. And then we'll have to, hopefully in Tuesday, you'll be able to identify those things listed with a cost next to it to the taxpayers. Uh, we are not necessarily on the host committee, uh, which I'm confused about because it's hosted in our stadium. <laughs> And we're not on the host, we're not part of the host committee, we're part of the, I guess the finance committee, we're financing it. Um, but one of the things I would like to see if, if that's the case, uh, we're taking up AstroTurf, we gotta put down grass. We're removing seats, reducing the size of Paul Brown Stadium. Those corners, when we talk about corners, we're talking about seats coming out, reducing the size. And then I guess you'll tell us a plan or a cost. Do those corners come back in? And is that a additional cost? Um, you indicated an impact, and I'm anxious to see the economic impact. But the part of that study that I'm only concerned about is the part in Hamilton County. I understand that Kentucky will benefit if we were to have this. Uh, with I'd like to know what is Kentucky's uh, how much they got to put in because if not they got the better end of the stick because they don't have to they don't have to tear astro turf and put grass down they don't have to take corners out of a stadium and and they don't have to bear the cost but they're bearing some of the benefit so i would just ask on tuesday to put in what is and usually when they do that economic they look at it from a tri-state perspective uh when only i'm only concerned about a hamilton county perspective the other thing you mentioned about uh, Major League Baseball, my understanding was the All-Star Game had a projected, we always have projected, we never hit those numbers, but they had a projected economic impact. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that number never happened, or if it did, I'd like to know what was the final result of the number. Uh, usually these projections, that we over-project. The other thing is, uh, I'd like to, on Tuesday, be able to answer the question about these tax-free zones because I really uh, want to have the World Cup. The only question I have is who's paying for it? Um, and then my next question is, if we can't make money off of these tax-free zones, and a lot of places they've been before, they've required tax-free zones, income tax-free zones, some sales tax-free zones, uh, they want to control concessions. So everything that we can make some money on, uh, back to the taxpayers, it seems like uh, World Cup wants to kind of gobble it up. Maybe that has changed, and you can answer that uh, on Tuesday, but that's one of the things that I'd like to see. What do we get besides public relations? Because that's a pretty expensive price for public relations. What kind of money, because I want to bring more money in 
so we can do reduce the cost on the people that actually live here. If we could bring money in and reduce the cost, then that's kind of a good business model. And then lastly, you indicated that the Bengals would have to go through this document and there's some agreements, because in their contract, it has something in there about professional soccer. In their contract, it has something in there about concessions. And is that going to be an additional cost? I'm sure they will probably worry about reducing the size of seats, seating, uh, because they do uh, season ticket holders. And I'm sure they would want those seats coming back in. So um, just like to hear that on uh, Tuesday. And from a big picture standpoint, um, my concern is we've got Convention district that just proposed 50, uh, uh, half a billion dollars between the hotel and uh, 100 million extra for convention center. That's almost a half a billion. We got a 200 page document, and that's not the final document of what the needs would be to enhance Paul Brown Stadium. And then we've got a lease that's getting ready to end with the Bengals, who's a tenant. Um, I'm just, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of 100, a half a billion dollar things going on. So I just want to make sure that our number one priority, obviously, is the facility that we already own. And then looking at what are the financial demands for us to get uh, to get the World Cup. Uh, most people thought the World Cup was going to be at FC Stadium. I run into people all the time and say, oh, I thought it was going to be an FC Stadium. It is not an FC Stadium. It's not big enough. It has to be in Paul Brown Stadium. Now we got to do a lot of tearing up. So just want to make sure that there's synergies um, and what would we be able to realistically get back in the coffers that we could direct those dollars to other things that we need uh, in the county. So I'm excited to hear uh, the list of what we have to have uh, along with the cost and then how we're going to fund those things uh, in your presentation Tuesday. I understand your presentation Tuesday, but you have to have an answer to them by May 31st, right? We'd have to make an agreement to these, whatever that list that you're presenting Tuesday. Is that correct? Well, we know that they that FIFA um, is, look, is looking to make an announcement on the 16th, so I would think that uh, in terms of uh, our role in this, we would want to um, review all of this next week, so at least by the end of the week, um, we would be able to, to go back to FIFA, yes. Okay, I'm sorry, that would be June. I'm sorry, not May 31st. That would be the first week of June that we have to, okay. Okay, great. Well, I'm looking forward to Tuesday uh, to now we got a better understanding what will be needed financially, who will be paying for it, uh, private money versus the, the public money, um, and certainly I'm erroring on both on most, I hope the private side is putting in a lot more uh, to help us get, get this, uh, this, thing, this deal done. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Dreyhouse. Um, yeah, I too am looking forward to a longer and more robust conversation on Tuesday. Um, one thing I'm hoping that you can bring forward at that time, um, as we talk about FIFA and the different host cities, plural, um, I don't have a very good understanding of what that means by way of if, if you're not the primary host, then, then what does a secondary host city do? And, you know, it, because I think that helps us better understand the ROI on whatever kind of investment we need to make uh, related to the income that would, that would be generated, depending on where we sit in the stack. So if you could, um, you know, at least for my, my assistance, help me better understand what that group of cities does what that looks like and uh, and so as we try pay attention to who gets these awards what does that really mean to Hamilton County so that's the one thing I'm hoping you can provide on Tuesday thank you got it thank you thank you and Jeff as you give a more detailed summary as you said on Tuesday I'm sure that staff will look at every criteria that we're being asked and do a cost-benefit analysis as it relates to the county is it good for the county and why is it good and all, rather than not rather than but giving us the details but also cost-benefit analysis of each criteria okay yeah, so, um, uh, and I'm happy to do this on, on Tuesday. I heard a couple of thoughts about doing this on, on Tuesday. Happy to do it uh, on Tuesday. And yeah, we will certainly do our best to break down the, the, the costs and the potential and the benefits as well. So to your question, okay. yes. Yeah, because um, 
Are, are you indicating you may need more time to do that or no you no, no you Ma madam president no i, I was uh, i think i initially indicated happy to report back to the board next week and then i heard a couple of folks ask for it during tuesday and i'm ha happy to do that i just okay. wanted to clarify that Great. yes thank you okay we will move forward for our regular agenda um item number one uh commissioner Driehaus, did you want to lead that discussion thank on you that? i appreciate that yeah and um, so we have been doing this resolution since 2019 do want to give a shout out to nate simon my previous aide who was the one that said you know do we do this in hamilton county and i said well if we don't we should uh and so that's kind of what generated the interest in doing this resolution um so the title of the resolution is directing county facilities to fly rainbow flags at county buildings because we have more than one in honor of lgbtq pride month and celebrating the contributions of the lgbtq community in hamilton county and so without reading the resolution i think the idea here and it always has been to um, celebrate the diversity in our community, celebrate all the people that um, add benefit to all of the things that we do throughout the community and especially the LGBTQ community who has um, just contributed greatly and um, this is a recognition of that benefit and a celebration really and because I, it, from my vantage point it is not enough to tolerate people it's better to celebrate people. And so that's what we're doing here with the resolution. And as an indication of that, as a sign of that, we will be flying the rainbow flags above the county facilities during Pride, June is Pride Month. I should have started with that. Uh, June is Pride Month. And so there will be celebrations uh, throughout the county. The big parade will happen towards the end of the month. And this resolution, there's no one here to accept it today because this resolution will be presented at the, um, the big parade and that there's a big festival afterwards and um, so it'll be presented as part of the county um, celebrating pride month at that uh, festivity so that's what the resolution does and I appreciate the support of the other offices Jack I appreciate you coming in and testifying in favor of the resolution love the idea of the city pride organization wondering if we ought not have a county pride organization so I, i'm very curious about that i don't know if we've ever thought about that before but it's certainly again just another signal to people that we in hamilton county uh, want to be a welcoming community and that is one of the ways we show uh, not only our welcoming nature but also the pride we have in the lgbtq community so with that madam president i offer the resolution um dead for for um, approval by the commission okay did you have any comments Okay, all righty. And if you'd like to make the motion. Can we make I, a motion? Sure. Yeah, I would just like to say, sure. um, starting in 2019, we as a board started to celebrate all people. And that's why you'll see all this coming forward. So this is great that it didn't happen before, but it's happening now. So if you'd like to make the motion. So I will uh, move that we approve of the resolution directing county facilities to fly rainbow flags at county buildings and honor the LGBTQ Pride Month and celebrating the contributions of the LD LGBTQ community in Hamilton County. Second. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next item of uh, business is item two, MSD. Sorry, Madam President. Sure. Why well, just come up? What, tell me again a day when will the, are we having a, well, no, the flag going up. Will we have something similar to the city? The flags will go up beginning of June. We have not had a flag raising ceremony for that, but it's something that we might want to consider. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We've done it for Juneteenth, right. but we have not done it for Pride. But yeah, well, let, let's we'll start working on that. Thank you. Thanks for the idea. Your comment. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, item number two. Well, MSD. Let me start by introducing myself. I'm sorry, Lauren DeGarcia with MSD. We have two items on the board's agenda this afternoon. Say that three times. Your name. My name. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's, say it again. DeGarcia. Yeah. Awesome. I think yeah. even I would start to screw it up yeah. at three. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Moving on with item number two, this item is to confirm the final revised assessments of 13 completed local and lateral sewer assessment projects against the 157 benefited parcels. Uh, as an overview, assessment sewers are projects that entail the construction of a local sewer and or sewer laterals or building sewers. 
uh, to serve individual properties. A portion of the project costs are assessed to the property owners that are benefited by the project, meaning that they now have public sanitary sewer service available. Uh, generally, these are properties that were previously served by on-site systems, septic systems, or similar. These projects can be initiated by petition of a benefited owner or owners or by order of the applicable Board of Health or Ohio EPA, but typically it is by petition. All of the projects included in this final assessment were supported by a majority, if not 100% of the benefited parcels. Uh, the assessment process is defined by Ohio law and for MSD further defined by its rules and regulations. This legislative item before you today is the final legislative step of that process. Uh, these projects have all been designed, they've been through any necessary public hearings, and they have been constructed and completed. Uh, this final step is to assess a portion of the project cost to the benefited property owners, and per MSD rules and regulations as adopted by the board, um, the amount assessed may not exceed $12,000 per property. Uh, since the total project costs will exceed the total maximum amount that they may be assessed, the balance of the project costs are paid with MSD funds. Uh, so most of these 157 benefited parcels will be assessed $12,000. Uh, there are four that qualified for a home sewage treatment system reimbursement credit uh, as determined by the Board of Health, and those properties will be assessed $8,400. And to provide a summary of the total project financials, uh, the appropriated total amount based on the estimated project cost of these 13 projects was appro approximately $8.9 million. Uh, the total final or actual costs was approximately $7.9 million, so MSD spent approximately $1 million less than was appropriated for these projects. And of that $7.9 million total costs, about $1.9 million, or 24%, will be assessed across the 157 benefited parcels and MSD will pay for just over $6 million or 76% of those final costs. Uh, in terms of next steps, if this legislation is adopted, uh, MSD will issue invoices to the benefited property owners for the assessed amount. Uh, we've already issued early warning letters uh, in addition to the communications that we've had over the course of these projects uh, with the property owners. Uh, so that invoice should not come as a surprise. Uh, they will have 30 days to pay all or part of the amount. Uh, that is the time period that's set by statute. Uh, so the deadline, if adopted today, would be Monday, June 27th at 4 p.m. After that, any unpaid portion of the cert will be certified to the county auditor and must be paid through their property taxes over a 20-year term of 40 biannual payments, uh, possibly to include interest and fees. Those unpaid amounts have to be certified to the auditor by September 12th of this year. Uh, that's also mandated by statute, which is why we recommended this date for adoption to allow for the 30-day collection period, as well as the county's reimbursement bond activities, all to be wrapped up and completed by that September deadline. Uh, so with that, we will take any questions. Jack Runnekamp is here to assist if the board has any questions. Thank you so much. You answered mine. I was um, thinking about the payment plan and options that are available to the residents, so you answered that for me. I'll pass it over to Vice President Reese. No questions. Mm -hmm. no okay. Questions. All right. Thank you. At that point, I'd like to make a motion to adopt item two. Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas. Yes. Commissioner Reese. Yes. Commissioner Driehaus. Yes. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item number three, this is a request to appropriate $2,287,000 in additional construction funding for the CSO 513 sewer separation project, which is a consent decree project included in MSD's wet weather improvement plan or WIP um, and is part of the bridge projects between the phase one and future consent decree phases as negotiated with the US EPA, Ohio EPA, and or Sanko. This project will separate stormwater from the combined sewers that currently flow to combined sewer outfall or CSO 513 by redirecting stormwater directly to both Cooper and Mill Creeks through new dedicated storm sewers, thus reducing combined sewer overflows at CSO 513 in compliance with consent decree requirements. Uh, the board authorized construction and appropriated a total of 5.4 million in construction funding in late 2021 uh, MSD received three bids for this project in early 2022. All three of the bids were between 20 and 60% over the engineer's estimated cost of 5.4 million. 
A construction contract cannot be awarded under Ohio law if the bids exceed the engineer's estimate by more than 10 percent. So at this point, MSD has revised the project estimate to accommodate this market reality as informed by the bids received and is requesting additional funding. Uh, if, if approved today, MSD will rebid the project as soon as possible. Uh, it's anticipated to be advertised next week. Uh, the increase in the estimated costs are based primarily on the following factors, again, as informed by the bids MSD previously received. Uh, inflation increased by 3.2 percent. Uh, for somewhat obvious reasons, uh, costs continue to rise. Uh, fuel increased by 28 to 53 percent. Uh, the cost of fuel has both direct and indirect effects. Rising prices make equipment more expensive to operate and also make it more costly to manufacture and deliver the materials needed for this project. Pipe uh, costs increased by 30 percent. Available information indicates limited supply and ripple effects of rising fuel prices. We're seeing bids that are inflated to offset the contractor's risk of potential price increases between when the bids are placed and when construction begins and those products are ordered. Uh, fill, this was an increase of $640,000 uh, for a change to use controlled low strength material or CLSM rather than native soils as backfill. Uh, we believe this change will mitigate risks of using native soils as backfill like trench collapse and uh, ground subsidence and potential related costs in excess of this increase to the estimate. And lastly, there were increases um, to soft cost contingencies of 7% as well as contractor overhead and profit 7%. And I have uh, Matt Spideri with me today from MSD Engineering to help with any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. We certainly have to stay on top of these uh, inflation prices. We understand them, but we have to be able to regulate them ourselves from the board and administration. So uh, those are some, some big increases. Um, um, Vice President Reese. No, no questions. questions. Yeah, I have Reese. a couple questions. Um, thank you for the presentation. Mm -hmm. So two things. One is uh, you noted that this is a bridge project. Can you provide the board with um, a status report on the bridge projects, just generally speaking, um, wh what they were and, you know, what was intended and the status of those projects um, at, at, you know, at your earliest convenience, hopefully within a week or two. Okay. Um, secondarily, because of what you are seeing related to the increase in cost, and we're seeing it everywhere, um, you know, and everything that we hear about and everything that we do. Is there any internal conversation at MSD about accelerating any of the projects to try to get ahead of some of the cost increases? Matt, did you want to take that? Good afternoon, Matt Spideri, MSD. Uh -huh. Uh, we are continuing to, to pr you know, progress with our projects, and like you've indicated, and I'm sure like you're seeing with other county agencies and departments, that there's some uncertainty out there and costs continue to rise. So we are trying to push them out. As far as accelerating them, we're just continuing to try to push them as much as we can to get, to get them out and keep our, keep our work moving with projects that were identified in, the, in our annual CIP. Okay. Okay. I just w wonder, it, the bridge projects were approved a number of years ago, so I just, that's why I'm asking for the status report. And I, I would be curious to know how, f if we're getting to the end, I hope, of the bridge projects, and if we can't, you know, as I said, accelerate some of the work on some of the projects that have been in the hopper for a while. C correct. With the, I'll give you a, an informal presentation, yep. I guess, on the, on the bridge, but there are three projects remaining and all of them have gone out to bid or excuse me two of the three have gone out to bid uh, one was awarded and i believe it's going to receive it's the contractor receive their notice to proceed next month in june cso 513 is one that we're here talking about we intend to rebid that next week upon uh, you know if this request is approved mm -hmm. today and then there's a third project that should advertise uh, later this summer or sometime this summer okay for Thank the you. for the bridge of the bridge projects mm -hmm. thanks thank you 
Thank you for your comments. And uh, when I met with Jeff uh, during our regular meeting, I indicated that uh, we'd like to see Diana Christie. We haven't seen her in a while. So uh, in the next couple of weeks, she's going to come in with a summary of where we are as, as far as our projects. So. Okay. Madam President, yes. uh -huh. can I ask that we also then get an update if MSD is going to come in mm -hmm. uh, related to the impervious surface fee? conversations that we've had and kind of where we're headed with that? Mm -hmm. Certainly. Yes, we're working, actively working on a communication to get back to the commissioners uh -huh. to further that. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'd like to make a motion to adopt item three. Second. Commissioner Summer Duma? Yes. Commissioner Reeves? Yes. Commissioner Dreehouse? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank uh -huh. you. Uh, we'll move forward on our consent agenda items. Um, Items four through 18, I normally give somewhat of a summary, but I would just ask if anyone has any concerns about any of the items that are listed, uh, Vice President Reese. Uh, not necessarily concerns, but I do have a couple sure. comments. Um, grab my notes here. Item number. Okay, so item number five. Um, item number five is a contract with, uh, uh, used to be HCDC, now Alloy. And I was just trying to figure out on here, maybe I didn't see it. Oh, I see it here. I just wanted to figure out, is this just the economic development or is this also the small business office? Uh, Madam President, yes. uh, Madam Vice President, uh, th this uh, would include the scope for the small business office as well. So uh, the, the contract that's before you today would include um, uh, alloy development companies uh, work on behalf of the county to implement um, business expansion and retention programming, all the incentive programs that they do, whether it's enterprise zones, CRAs, that type of thing, uh, the loan programs, the uh, community support that they do when they're out in the community uh, working with uh, first ring suburban communities etc the office of innovation and creativity and also the implementation of the new small business office so that would all be included in the uh, in the scope of service on this contract okay thank you and the other thing on the scope of service I noted uh, I noticed on this um, I'm with item number six in the scope of services uh, contract and I had asked about this um, if, if this is included in all of our contracts because I know we've had some situations where we came back and um, in my mind uh, paid out things that we were not liable to pay. My understanding from my time in the Department of Development for the state, uh, usually there's cookie cutter language that says that when we do a contract with someone, I don't care if it's it could be Alloway, it could be Port Authority, whoever, um, that we have an uh, indemnification, indemnification clause in there, which basically holds us harmless if they were to subcontract or someone were to sue them. And I notice it's in this um, contract, which I think is great, but is this boiler point, because I thought as a state, I know we're part of the Ohio Revised Code, et cetera, and usually when you do work for the government, no matter who you are, it's in there. I saw it in this. I haven't seen it in all uh, other contracts. Is this boilerplate language that we'll be using from now on? It's item number six. They must have insurance. They must hold us harmless. They must indemnify us because I haven't seen that in contracts, say, with Port Authority or other, and even with 3CDC. Uh, if they're going to do the, the convention uh, district and hotel, we need some hold harmless instead of us coming back, having to pay should they get sued by someone else. So uh, I think it's good it's in here. I'm just wondering, I, I, don't, I know you don't do all the contracts. This is just maybe one of them, but I'd like to see this, uh, and all of them, including uh, no matter who you are. Yeah, um, Mark, Mark, do you want to touch on that just briefly? I, I can touch on part of that. Mark Von Allman, Senior Policy Manager on Economic Development. I was just going to mention that uh, this language, from my understanding, work, working with the prosecutor's offices is relatively boilerplate language that we've included. In this agreement, there was some updates as far as our insurance language that we also worked with risk man management on and put that in here, changes based from the last contract that was 
brought before you in 2018. Um, but the indemnification uh, language in here is, is, from my understanding, nothing terribly specific for this contract, but instead boilerplate language that the prosecutor's office probably looks to build in when applicable. So they, they, they insert it into this agreement. Okay. I just asked the uh, administrator, I haven't seen the contract uh, on the convention district. I, I've seen, I know we have an existing contract with Port Authority and other people, and I'm not, they're not the only ones. I like to see one set of rules. I like to see it in all of it um, because I don't want, we're, we're, we get a lot of people to do stuff on our behalf and they may have a subcontractor or somebody who wants to sue and I don't want to have what we're paying for it, the taxpayers. Uh, that's the reason that we kind of use other people. So um, this is good. I'm saying it's good item number five. I'm asking that it be uh, this language be in the contracts, you know, not just selectively, but uh, you know, especially the ones that's doing the big, big stuff. I mean, this is a small, not small, but relatively small contract. But the big ones, I don't see where they're uh, holding the taxpayers harmless. We are held on the hook. Uh, they're in charge making decisions, and then when it's time to get sued, all of a sudden it's our, it's our, it's our responsibility to pay your legal fees. So I'd like to see this type of language. I thought it was law that it had to be in all the language for government contracts but I would like to see it in, in all of our contracts. We'll check on this all of them great. and get back to the board, but yes, uh, as Mark said, it was definitely in this one, so we'll, but we'll get back to the board on the other contracts reference as well. Thank you, it, huh? great job on that. Um, um, item number eight, uh, I, had a quick, I had a comment on Madam President. This is our um, ARPA plan mm -hmm. that was presented and uh, input from the Community, this is the final, I want to make sure this is the final piece. This is, this is the final piece and this reflects all of the changes that we made uh, to increase affordable housing, also to reallocate dollars for uh, direct services related to uh, youth, mental health, teen suicide. Um, we uh, had pulled out the um, marketing program for uh, mental health stigma so that we could uh, put the dollars towards more, dir more direct services. This also takes into account a change um, uh, per some of the public comments that were made over the past couple of weeks, um, which was intended this way to begin with, uh, but we made it much more clear that um, for the portion of the, of the ARPA plan that deals with uh, workforce coordination, um, we heard some comments uh, from some, some of the public about why there was a specific entity referenced in the report um, and that was always intended to be to be bid. Uh, so we just made it much more clear uh, that for that workforce coordinating entity that that would be subject to competitive procurement. So those are the main changes within the uh, within the ARPA plan. Okay. And then I believe um, there was some concern of some people being left out. A AFL CIO uh, came and uh, presented. Did your office reach out to them or? So I've had some discussions on that, didn't reach out directly to them, but as was indicated and we have um, uh, gotten back to the board on, um, there was labor uh, present uh, at, the, at the stakeholder sessions uh, when, when we did hold those sessions um, uh, over, the, over, that four, over that four month uh, period. Uh, but I believe the main concern was the, uh, the indication of a specific entity to coordinate workforce funding um, moving forward. And so we did respond to that by making sure that that would be subject to, compet to a competitive procurement process, that there was not one entity listed and designated for that. Okay. And as we put out the competitive bid, will we make sure that list is, they're inclusive in that list? Absolutely. So that they don't, okay. Okay, great. And then all the other things that we had already pre-approved, uh, those are already passed or are they included in this document? I'm sorry, um, Madam Vice President, could you repeat? Uh, uh, all the other things, you know, we had passed some things for the ARPA dollars, uh, what I call the right now. Yeah, that, this, would, this the, would include, this would subsume all of that as well, correct? Okay. Yes. Yeah, this is great. I just would ask, um, Madam President, because we got a lot that we have here, and I know we say first quarter, second quarter, if we could get um, 
at some point a timeline on each of them, like because we don't kind of went back and forth. We moved some things around. We made some changes based on uh, feedback that we got. We could get um, a final uh, timeline of these because all of them won't be this year. Some might be next year or what have you. So we kind of um, each of our offices have a timeline. If someone were to call, we can go right to the timeline and say, no, that's not 22. That's 23 or something of that magnitude. Absolutely, and I know uh, I was discussing yesterday with Assistant Administrator Chrisman um, that she is, in fact, right now working with her staff to put together that, that schedule. So we'll get that out to the board here quickly so you just have that as stakeholders call and question you about when certain programs are gonna launch, you can uh, be very direct in terms of what the plan is. Then my last question is about the Finley Market. I understand we met the threshold now uh, to get moving but then there were two things on here it was like a Finley market and then item number seven is that just the um, item number seven has law enforcement assistant diversion personnel but then also has Finley market garage construction costs so is that just to get the purchase order yeah, once one's the contract one is the budget adjustment um, but Phil is here if there's any specific questions about the the contract okay and then is this the what do we have a total budget for the garage Yes, we do. Phil Beck, uh, Hamilton County Construction Executive. Executive, yes, our uh, our hard costs for the garage, which this is part of, are in the magnitude of twenty four and a half million. Um, and as you know, this was a rebid. Uh, we bid the first time. Uh, the prices came in over our engineer's estimate for uh, similar reasons that uh, MSD just quoted uh, on their sewer projects. Uh, it's it as Commissioner Driehaus stated before, it's across the board, it's hitting all aspects of the county. Um, so yeah, so we are, we are within that budget and these, um, this rebid project uh, was actually under our engineer's estimate. Uh, we received two bids and they, on, as you can see the magnitude, 10.6 million, the two bids were $28,000 apart. So we know it's, it's on the money. Thank you. And what you said that I know you mentioned a hard cost, not a soft cost. Is that your architect design, et cetera? I was just trying to get what is the total cost? Total, total that we're looking at, including property purchase. Everything that goes property there. was 2.2. <laughs> 2. Okay. So we are in the magnitude 29 million. 29 million, okay. Yeah, okay. all in. Okay. Hard, soft, property, everything. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Driehaus. Uh, yes, thank you. I was gonna call out also uh, items six and seven, not so much to ask questions, but to recognize that we're moving forward with Finley Market Garage, um, and uh, thankful that we have bids now that we can move forward with. So uh, glad to see that's moving. Um, there are many, many people wondering and waiting about the Finley Market Garage. Uh, so this is good news. And then uh, I, I too was gonna talk about item number eight. You know, this one, it's such a big deal. We've been dealing with it for so long that um, it's in front of us on the consent agenda. Uh, but this is a huge, huge item for us. Uh, and we've had um, a huge um, and in inclusive stakeholder process that we ran to get ideas and to get input about how we can invest the American Rescue Plan dollars from the federal government. And by the way, I, we do, you know, I, I do feel compelled to, sh to give a big shout out to the federal government because without these dollars coming in, um, we wouldn't have the opportunity to do any of this investment. But we were very careful about this money. We wanted to make transformational change in the community. And so we are now poised to approve of this item with all the input from the three of us and the community and the stakeholders to come up with a really important and transformational plan for um, the different buckets that we identified as a priority those primarily being mental health, housing, youth development, workforce, 
Um, so I, I think it's a really important plan. I think it's an important investment by this board. This is probably the last opportunity we're going to have to invest federal dollars into uh, as a response to COVID-19. And so I think we have done this in a really thoughtful way. I want to applaud the administration, particularly uh, Jeff Aluto and Holly Chrisman, for all their work on this. Um, but I really was proud of the process, and I'm proud of the result as well. So thank you to all that participated, and um, hopefully this money will uh, soon roll out and start this transformational change that it's intended to do. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'll digress and have some discussion on these issues. Since we're discussing them, I was going to wait and maybe talk uh, in private about some of them. But I will go to also to item eight, our American Rescue Plan, which we're finally um, passing. And there was much discussion, much inclusion. We left no stone unturned as it relates to what areas we want to have impact. So I'm also very excited about that. And JFS, I, I just really need to say it. Um, items 9, 10, and 11, we're continuing to uh, take care of our youth and adult protective services. Um, for family preservation, item 9, $200,000. Item 10, uh, adult protective services, along with psychological assessment, 75000 and item 11 is residential treatment services for our uh, youth, 165,000. In addition, under the sheriff uh, department, and I'm sure it's in our resolution, Jeff, but when I added up the amount of credit cards that we're um, approving, uh, it was $260,400 for uh, individual credit cards that could be used by the sheriff department uh, through different banks. And I am assuming, and I don't want to do that, that those credit cards can be used for gas and what other uh, things Typically can they travel, uh, travel. Uh, training, gasoline, uh, some, some supplies, et cetera, uh, is typically what those are, are used for. Uh, this amount, this 260000 is that what we normally do, or how does that relate to what we... Uh, I can check it with, yeah, past, with past years, but I don't yeah. think this is any different for the given the size of that office and the number of divisions. Mm -hmm. um, this is pro I believe this is consistent with what we've done in the past, but I can check on that. And so the use of the cards would be done by sergeants, lieutenants, the, the sheriff herself? I mean, not... It, line this would be yeah, throughout the department. So line sheriffs would also have the car because they're driving the cars to get the gas. Yeah. So, so tip, uh, typically these would be on a like a division basis. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not sure exactly how they do it over there, but like over here, we have a, a a card, and if that's needed for travel or training or whatever, someone can access that card for that purpose. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, my only last comment is. Um, Item 18, we're reporting, uh, uh, the Sheriff Department is reporting no objection to eight liquor permit applications. I don't know, maybe it's me, but we've been having more liquor applications than I'm used to having, which I understand that when you have liquor in your establishment, you can, of course, make more money, but we need to um, just kind of keep, keep a gauge on. Um, I know as, as far as the Sheriff Department, if there's no criminal activity, there's been no calls, things like that, um, liquor license can be approved, but we also want to make sure they have to look at how close it is to a school and things like that. So I just want to make sure that we're not us, but the Sheriff Department, of course, is paying attention to uh, the number of applications and where they're actually located. Um, we used to have, I know uh, in Forest Park, there used to be, we used to have a map, it's smaller, of course, of where these entities are. And I'm not sure if the Sheriff might have something like that or not. Or maybe the Liquor License Board in Columbus, we might could find out. But we've been getting a lot of applications for a liquor applica uh, liquor, liquor uh, permit. So that way in my comments, um, I, did you, uh -huh. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm um, okay. just going back to, to item, uh, to item number eight. I, mm -hmm. I just also want to highlight, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about affordable housing and we as a board, as a county, we're leading in terms of investment. And I just don't want that to be taken lightly. Um, because that is a major crisis. So $40 million mm -hmm. is no chump change. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to, to highlight that, and I also want to thank uh, the uh, administration. Um, 
Jeff and his team for articulating and being able to hear from the people and our board be able to hear what we have heard from the people and we have put forward. Uh, but I also think this uh, can be transformational for our county. Uh, most people are going to find out what happened after COVID, even though we're still fighting it. But it's almost a reset button mm -hmm. for counties and cities, villages, townships across the United States. And so we want to be able, to, when we come, as we come out of this, we have been transformational in the things that we have invested in. We've come out with a, a mobile bus that will be ongoing to help people in variety of health ways as well as economic ways. Um, as well, we have a variety as it relates to affordable housing for people with disabilities, reentry, senior citizens, and everyday working people, uh, as well as helping with those who are uh, homeless. So I do want to, I just wanted to make sure uh, that that is highlighted among other things that we are delivering. Washington, we very much appreciate. We have done better than most counties around the United States. Many, even in Ohio, were unable to spend their money. They didn't know how to get it out. They couldn't get it to the people. It was bottled up. Um, our county has done, I think, a remarkable job of our, from our board all the way to the staff of getting the help to the people. So as Washington released the money, which we greatly appreciate, first time in history that Washington bailed out the American people directly and not through uh, you know, they usually do it through an industry, the banking industry or the automotive industry. They went directly to the people. Uh, but just like with Amazon, you can make an order. But if the order never shows up, you never got the package. And we have been the delivery system to get the package, the, the, the direct service directly to the people. So I want to thank all of our, our staff and through the leadership of our administrator uh, as well as this board on getting the delivery. Now, we haven't been able to help everybody. We still are working. We still want to improve. But we, I think, have been a model for a lot of people in the country on how to do it right and do it correctly and help the people. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I agree. Madam President, yes. if I could just on the consent agenda, just two quick items I just wanted to acknowledge. Uh, number one, uh, the board had mentioned uh, a couple of times the uh, item number five, which is the agreement with um, uh, Alloy Development Company. I did. I know Catherine Fitzgerald is here. Catherine, not asking you to come forward, uh, but uh, just in absentia. I know that typically we also have Harry Blanton here with us, and I just wanted to acknowledge to the board that I believe today, although he's not here, but today Harry Blanton is celebrating his 30th year at Alloy, for, formerly HCDC, now Alloy Development Company. Uh, so. Uh, 30 years, one organization doing economic development on behalf of the community, a great thing. So I just wanted to congratulate Harry. I doubt that he's listening in, but uh, if, if he is, uh, just- Kevin's been alive. Just, uh, <laughs> almost as long, that's right, almost as long as Kevin and I have been alive, right? So, yeah. Um, and, and secondly, I can't see around the pillar, so I'm sorry if she may have left, but I did just want to, note the fact that I believe it is uh, one of our items on here related to our community development action plan uh, and I believe Maria Collins was here uh, if she's, she's not still here. She's, she's still here, here. okay uh -huh. um, and, and I believe this would have, been the, would have been the first time that Maria would have been formally at one of our, our, our meetings uh, and I just wanted to acknowledge her so Thank even though I can't you. see you Maria welcome to, to the meeting and uh, and glad that Maria is on board um, leading our community development staff so thank you commissioners Thank you so much for those comments. Um, with all that being said, I'd like to make a motion to approve items four through 18. Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas. Yes. Commissioner Reeves. Yes. Commissioner Dreamhouse. Yes. Thank you so much. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas. Yes. Commissioner Reeves. Yes. Commissioner Dreamhouse. Yes. Thank you.